website is up, uh, New York AUA. Uh, so please visit for any lectures you may have uh, missed last week. There's also surveys. Um, we're always looking to improve. So uh, we very much appreciate all the information we've gotten already. Um, we're very fortunate today to have Dr. Scleris out of the University of Michigan with us. Um, our very own Dr. Brandis will be introducing and they have a very strong connection. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give it to you, Dr. Brandis, but Dr. Scleris, thank you so much for being with us today uh, for our first speaker this week. Thank, thank you. you. So uh, I'm introducing uh, Dr. Ted Scleris, who's the chief of the VA at the VA in Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan. He's an associate professor of urology also at the University of Michigan. Um, uh, Ted trained with us at Washington University in uh, urology and then went on to a fellowship in urologic oncology also at the University of, uh, of Michigan. And he's done great work there and has been very uh, productive. And he's going to give us a, a talk based on his NCI Merit uh, R32 grant and uh, and I asked uh, Ted to give us a little blurb about one, uh, their MPH program, their R32 uh, fellowship, and uh, the research program that they, uh, they have. And I don't know if everyone is aware how the University of Michigan have been the trendsetters for outcomes, data mining, big data research uh, in urology. So. Uh, it's a great honor to present Dr. Scolaris, and uh, we're all eager for his talk. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Dr. Brandis. Um, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity. And so, um, and I'll touch base on it uh, a little bit at the end, uh, but I just wanted to mention, we do have a fellowship training in both benign and uh, urologic oncology, supported by NIH T32 program, uh, where you can come to Ann Arbor and, and um, really get a, a good exposure and um, learn about health services, implementation research, and uh, big data, and um, how to incorporate that into your academic uh, career. So thank you. Um, my two disclosures uh, are both related to NCI-related uh, grants. The first one I'll speak uh, about uh, today, it's de-implementation of low-value low uh, castration for men with prostate cancer, and the second uh, is an R01 looking at how do we refine castration use and ADT use for biochemical uh, recurrent disease? And so I just wanted to pause a moment and say thank you to Dr. Brandis for inviting me and also to really say thank you to all you folks in New York and all that you're doing. Um, it's recognized uh, here in the Midwest and I think across our country and across the world um, the challenges and, and things and the great work you're doing there. So thank you. With respect to uh, my interest in the talk this morning, um, so really uh, I became interested in prostate cancer survivorship um, during fellowship. Uh, so after uh, Washington University with Dr. Brandes, I went to the University of Michigan for uh, oncology and health services research. and really wanted to look at that longitudinal period men uh, and their partners face uh, dealing with the side effects of, of treatment, uh, symptom management, and how providers um, uh, took care of uh, these men as they lived uh, a decade or more uh, after their diagnosis. My clinical interests are in neurologic oncology and telemedicine, and, and during fellowship, I really became interested in implementation research or implementation science. And it's really the study of practice change and how do we implement best practices and evidence-based practices into routine healthcare delivery. And it involves understanding behavioral theory and uses different frameworks and models and um, to really understand and understand the pathways to healthcare delivery and how we can um, use those to improve uh, the value of care. And within that, I became interested, and I'll share a little bit about this story, uh, about low value ADT and kind of the overuse of, of hormone therapy for prostate cancer. And so here's an outline for uh, the talk this morning. Uh, I'll start off with a story of androgen deprivation 
uh, use and, and overuse for the treatment of prostate cancer. Uh, it's not the story, it's a story. Um, my story um, with ADT begins as, as a resident, much like many of uh, you folks uh, listening this morning. And I was in a resident run clinic and there was a 80 year old gentleman who came in uh, to clinic for his three month injection. And I looked at the charts and I dug back a ways and found that he had been on uh, primary ADT as monotherapy for localized prostate cancer for years. And his PSA had been low. And I just remember thinking that, you know, it wasn't really benefiting his quality of life. And I didn't think it was going to benefit his quantity of life. So it made me really pause and think about how to, how best uh, to stop that. And and um, the conversations we had were, were quite uh, memorable. So then we'll move on to some implementation science, what we can learn from this field and how those lessons might apply to practice change. Uh, and moreover, um, de-implementation or stopping uh, hormone therapy in cases of where it's low value and uh, the scientific approach there. And so I've increasingly uh, become um, interested in the history of kind of our care delivery. And I know uh, Dr. Brand is, uh, has a, has a uh, appreciation for history in, in urologic disease. Um, here's two major uh, studies. Uh, the one on the right is some Nobel uh, Prize winning work by Huggins and Hodges, where they really started to understand in 1941 uh, the implications of testosterone and uh, castration um, for men with metastatic prostate cancer. Not only would, would it improve their uh, symptoms, it would also decrease their serum phosphatase. And here's a report in the New England Journal of Medicine shortly thereafter, looking at the relationship between uh, castration and advanced prostate cancer and the, and the potential treatment opportunities. And so as we think about the evolutionary context of castration, and this will become important uh, as we talk about implementation and de-implementation, uh, understanding how did we get here? How did we get to uh, the use of hormone therapy for prostate cancer? And so um, if you see the surgical castration with orchiectomy was you know, basically identified in, in the 40s and really revolutionized uh, the prostate cancer field. And over the subsequent decades, started to learn that the relationship between androgens and prostate cancer and that castration uh, could improve clinical outcomes for some patients. And then if we fast forward to the 1990s, um, we have long acting uh, injectable uh, ADT or GnRH agonists that become available and even lucrative, which is adds an interesting context uh, to the story of hormone therapy for prostate cancer. This is some work by Dr. Uh, Bahakan Shahinian. He's uh, here at Michigan now and one of my collaborators, but this was early work looking at um, the rise of chemical castration over surgical orchiectomy in the 1990s. So if you see here on the x-axis, we have uh, the year of diagnosis over the decade. On the y-axis, you have the proportion of patients getting uh, hormone therapy. And you can see that the boxes uh, go down and orchiectomy rates really uh, decrease. And there's a rise in GnRH agonist that goes beyond uh, the original baseline uh, of surgical orchiectomy. And so uh, I would posit two things from this. And, and now that surgery was no longer needed to, for castration, uh, that lowered the threshold for recommending and uh, ADT and expanding uh, use and may have led in some cases, because the evidence wasn't uh, evolved yet, uh, to a false reassurance of remission by lowering PSA levels. So we could understand that men weren't living a, um, having a better quality of life on ADT. Um, and it may be that they weren't actually getting survival benefits or increase in quantity of life. Now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this became an actual uh, lucrative business practice uh, for a couple of reasons. So the Medicare uh, payments or reimbursements uh, 
before ADT injections to the practices was 95% of the average wholesale price. Now, some of the groups and um, uh, providers were getting them at discounted uh, prices. And so there was a differential there that may have incentivized uh, the hormone therapy use. And when the Part B tab for ADT, the Medicare Part B tab, uh, hit a billion dollars in 2003, this um, incited real scrutiny on this practice. And the Medicare Modernization Act took that into consideration and, and reduced payments by uh, 50%. So let's see what happens. So how did changing the incentives impact treatment patterns? Uh, here's uh, some work in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, by Dr. Shahinian and a Columbia uh, residency uh, graduate, uh, Dr. Scott Gilbert, who uh, was one of my predecessors at uh, the University of Michigan in, in the Health Services Research uh, Division, where they looked at and hypothesized that decreasing payments for ADT for prostate cancer would differentially impact um, appropriate versus inappropriate care. So what they termed appropriate care was adjuvant uh, ADT with radiation therapy for high-risk uh, disease. And inappropriate care would be primary treatment of localized prostate cancer with ADT. And so what did they find? Um, so I'll direct your attention to the top left uh, part of the screen where you see two lines, a blue line, which is the rate of adjuvant ADT for uh, men with uh, receiving radiation therapy. And you can see that over the implementation years of the Medicare Modernization Act, you saw a stable use of that appropriate treatment, despite the red line, which showed decreasing payments or incentives for ADT uh, administration. Now, if you go to panel B, which is in the bottom right corner, you'll see that there's a, a greater correlation between the amount of payment um, as shown in the darker line and primary ADT use, which would be considered inappropriate in the majority of cases, such that decreasing incentives um, led to decreased inappropriate and discretionary use. Around that time, um, 2005 uh, headlines, again, Dr. Shahinian, looking at the side effects of ADT use. And this is another major article that uh, folks should know about. And um, he found that ADT was associated with fractures and skeletal related events. So if you look at the figure, the years after diagnosis of prostate cancer using SEER Medicare data and administrative uh, uh, database. And if you look on the y-axis, you'll see uh, fracture-free survival. And this was a revelation showing that there's a dose dependency of a uh, relationship uh, between the amount of ADT that you get and the number of uh, doses and your fracture risk. So now in the 2000s, we're starting to see the side effects of this injectable therapy. Fast forward five years in 2010, um, there's a scientific advisory uh, there over that period. Uh, this was during my residency and, and, and fellowship. There, was, uh, there were papers coming out saying that ADT was associated with um, increasing uh, cardiac events and cardiovascular risk. This was a combined advisory panel um, with the AUA and the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association and uh, American Society of Radiation Oncology really put together to look at the evidence that ADT might actually cause uh, cardiac disease and cardiac events. Ultimately, they found um, a potential association and, and increase in metabolic syndrome and risk factors for cardi cardiac events, however, did not make a causal uh, association. However, it was now on, on the radar. So if you think about um, what we've learned about the adverse effects of, of castration among men uh, with prostate cancer, you can see that it ranges from uh, the quality of life, impacting the quality of life with um, hot flashes and erectile dysfunction and fatigue, 
uh, to potentially impacting the quantity of life uh, through worsening diabetes and fractures and cardiovascular disease and stroke and, and many other things uh, that have been associated with ADT over the years. And this has really uh, started to fascinate me um, with respect to the impact of long-term impact, survivorship impact uh, for men on ADT. Um, I was fortunate to help lead uh, in 2013-2014 uh, the American Cancer Society's uh, Prostate Cancer Survivorship Care Guidelines. Um, and so this was an uh, evidence uh, synthesis and review and expert opinion-based uh, review of uh, recommendations for the long-term survivorship care of men uh, treated and diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so um, it addressed things like surveillance for recurrence and screening for secondary cancers. It also uh, addressed the late and long-term effects of prostate cancer treatment, things that Dr. Brandis might deal with, um, urethral stricture disease and rectourethral fistulas, things like that. It also addresses uh, hormone therapy and ADT for prostate cancer and the amount of side effects um, that providers and patients need to be aware of uh, for men um, uh, treated with this approach. And so um, this started me focusing on the long-term uh, implications of primary ADT um, in men with prostate cancer. So not only was this the primary treatment choice, and I, when I speak of this, I talk about monotherapy for localized prostate cancer. So men with localized, not metastatic prostate cancer receiving ADT instead of observation or a definitive treatment like radiation or surgery. And so uh, one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Borza, is now at Wisconsin, uh, looked at um, prostate cancer uh, treatment in the um, uh, different uh, screening recommendations. But uh, this is a table from uh, one of the studies uh, and basically shows that primary androgen deprivation therapy was used um, in about just over 10% of Medicare beneficiaries. So one in 10 men treated with androgen deprivation monotherapy. This is a study using a different database, the National Cancer Database, which shows that primary ADT increases with age and comorbidity, uh, potentially raising under treatment concerns. So there's uh, overuse of this treatment, potential underuse of this treatment. So if you see in this figure, we have age brackets across the um, uh, x-axis, and we have primary ADT among men who didn't receive any uh, definitive treatment. And the red bars represent high-risk disease. And so among uh, men with high-risk disease that weren't treated uh, with any other approach, you could see an increase in primary ADT. And even among men with intermediate risk disease, that also increased uh, potentially um, as over-treatment and under treatment in the red bar. So both men with intermediate high risk disease getting ADT monotherapy. Here's some health services research done by uh, Dr. Salmon and Trin and colleagues looking at mortality benefits in the long term for primary ADT among men with prostate cancer. And what you see here in this figure on the right is a survival curve. Uh, where you have years of life on the x-axis and probability of survival on the y-axis. And you see a blue line, which is observation for men uh, with localized prostate cancer. And you see a red line for men undergoing primary ADT. And what that shows you is worse survival for men uh, using primary androgen deprivation therapy, potentially uh, due to worsening of uh, underlying uh, comorbidities. So the value of primary ADT is questioned in the long term. Here's some work by Dr. Albertson and Lu Yao and colleagues have been doing this for quite a while where they looked at 15 year survival outcomes saying, 
primary ADT is not associated with improved survival or disease specific survival for men with localized prostate cancer and that it really should be used much like was used originally to palliate symptoms of disease or prevent in, imminent symptoms associated with disease progression. There have been some randomized trials looking at men with locally advanced disease who are not suitable for other treatments. This was an EORTC trial looking at early versus delayed ADT. And what they found is a, a potential uh, benefit to earlier ADT among these men. However, also if everyone who had um, locally advanced disease got early ADT, you would be over treating a lot of men with respect to survival. And uh, the paper down on the right went into that trial data and looked at uh, risk factors. So they found that a PSA over 50 and um, doubling time of your PSA of more than 12 months actually uh, was uh, associated with improved survival with early ADT. However, um, in other cases, it might not be beneficial. And so what, what do the guidelines say? So the AUA 2017 guideline statement uh, says that clinicians should not recommend primary ADT for patients with high risk prostate cancer unless they have patient has both limited life expectancy and local and local symptoms hematuria, uh, urinary obstruction. The EAU 2020 uh, recommendations off the website um, demonstrate for um, men with intermediate risk disease, um, you shouldn't offer ADT monotherapy to um, asymptomatic men not able to receive localized treatment. Again, for high risk uh, localized, do not use ADT monotherapy in asymptomatic men. And then for locally advanced disease, you should offer ADT to those who aren't eligible for uh, or unwilling to have another treatment and who have a PSA over 50 or doubling time uh, less than 12 months or poorly differentiated tumor. So um, here's the NCCN guidelines. If you look, um, this is for the high or very high risk uh, group. Uh, if they have a life expectancy over five years, they should get a definitive uh, treatment. Um, and if you look down in the bottom left corner, less than five year life expectancy and they're asymptomatic, you could observe them. You could give them ADT as monotherapy or radiation therapy. But there are some considerations. And um, this first one says that it should be used in high or very high risk disease where complications can be expected within five years and that um, it should only be used as monotherapy um, in contraindications to definitive local uh, therapy. So um, with that, there is uh, opportunity, I think, to um, understand how best to use this approach and what is uh, the right amount uh, of rate. And I would argue that it's um, important to do that for two reasons. One is that a lot of men may be overtreated, and two, once men start along this path, uh, they continue to come in for uh, their injections and, and may be subject to long-term uh, ADT. So now I'll move on to what we can learn from uh, implementation science, this uh, new emerging uh, field that I've become interesting, uh, really interested in, in terms of how we can learn from this to improve our clinical practice delivery. And so we'll just get some definitions out of the way. Um, this uh, implementation is often coupled with uh, dissemination research. And I'll, I'll define these here as defined by the NCI and uh, the NIH. And so dissemination um, is the targeted distribution of information and materials to a public health audience or clinical practice uh, audience. And this could be a smoking cessation program that you roll out across uh, multiple clinics in a, in, a, in a health system or across hospital systems, um, more of a passive uh, approach. Implementation is defined as the use of strategies to adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions or evidence-based practices and change practice patterns within specific settings. So in other words, you're using strategies um, 
to implement best practices or evidence-based practices within uh, different clinic settings, such as a rural clinic or a tertiary care clinic or a referral center clinic, where there's different levels of expertise and resources. And so one way I found to kind of conceptualize uh, implementation research uh, is with respect to the NIH translational roadmap, which uh, some of you may be uh, familiar with. And so I like to use this um, schema uh, from a, a JAMA article. And so if you look at, um, if we think about uh, translational research and we think about um, um, getting bench to bedside, we can look at the top left uh, figure here and see we have basic science research translated through T1 uh, into the bedside and to human clinical research, phase three clinical trials, and that's really translating the bench to bedside to humans. And then if we look across the midline here, we see that bedside to practice takes those things uh, that we learn in clinical trials and controlled studies and translates them through this step T2 into clinical practice. And so that we get the right care to the right patient at the right time. If we delve a little deeper into that translational step, it starts to get quite interesting and complex. We see that there's um, translation to patients down here on the left where we have guidelines and uh, systematic reviews and really understanding the evidence that's driving um, this in the real world. And then if we look down here on the right, we have translation of health services research and guidelines and uh, which take into consideration the studies to practice. And you see here T step, the T3 step of dissemination research and implementation research. So how do we get the things that we know to work translated into clinical practices so that we ultimately uh, get the best care? And so I like to think about um, uh, implementation research uh, on a, a, as a precursor to the, to the primary outcomes that uh, we think that we typically think about in oncology research or in any type of research. And so um, this is based off of uh, Dr. Proctor's um, implementation model, some work uh, we did. And so if you think about what we typically uh, look for in uh, outcomes for uh, research, we think about patient satisfaction, we think about symptom improvement, we think about urinary function or uh, bladder function, and in, uh, oftentimes we think about survival outcomes. So these are the ultimate goals of our research, I would argue. Now, there was uh, a realization that um, the Institute of Medicine, now called the National Academy of Medicine, realizes that if you want to get to these far right outcomes, you need to deliver care that is safe, that is effective, that is timely, that is equitable and efficient. So if then they started measuring these things using health services research and the relationship between those and these oncology outcomes. But implementation research focuses even further upstream on those evidence-based practices that you're trying to put into clinical care delivery and whether those are acceptable in clinical practice. I like to think of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy for prior to cystectomy. Um, is what is the cost of that? What is the feasibility in a given practice setting? Um, what's the fidelity to the actual, how they did it in the trial and how sustainable are those practices? So this is kind of where implementation research falls. And this is a slide that got me really excited about doing this type of research because um, it, it shows how important it is to uh, getting um, things we know work into practice. So let's take that neoadjuvant chemotherapy example for cystectomy. Let's say that a major article comes out and it shows a 20% survival advantage in, in a clinical trial. So now we're gonna walk through what happens in real world care delivery without um, appropriate implementation. So I'll keep your eye on this percent impacted of the population on the right hand side. So let's say you roll it out and half of clinics adopt this new practice that has a survival advantage. Let's say half of practitioners within those clinics actually use the uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy approach. 
let's say half of their patients actually accept that, um, that they want to do neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Let's say half of those folks actually get all four cycles of, of chemotherapy. They don't substitute uh, different types and, and don't come off uh, and um, don't come off of uh, have treatment uh, in delays and interruptions. And actually, um, let's say half of those uh, actually get the benefit from that due to heterogeneity of, of effects and different uh, physiology and pathophysiology. And let's say half of those uh, actually end up adhering to the treatment protocol after six months. And you can see why this volt how this voltage drop leads to uh, really poor uptake and improving real world, out real world outcomes despite high level evidence. So that's what got me excited about implementation research. This is a, a, a nice textbook um, uh, that kind of talks about implementation as a next step for our urologic research. And the other thing I like about this field is that it's transdisciplinary. It involves economics and marketing and uh, social sciences and a variety of different uh, fields to come together to actually make a difference in real world delivery settings. So we do have a growing uh, cadre of uh, expertise in urology. So here's some work I did with my mentor, Ann Sales. Here's some work with one of our former fellows, uh, Dr. Florian Schreck, and uh, up at Dartmouth, um, looking at implementing uh, risk-aligned bladder cancer surveillance with Jeremy Shelton, urologist um, uh, with implementation science training at uh, uh, UCLA. Um, here's some work by New York's uh, own Dan Makarov, uh, looking at uh, guideline concordant uh, use. Um, uh, Stacy Loeb is also trained in implementation uh, science. And then at UNC with uh, Matt Nielsen and um, Sarah Perkin, looking at overuse and, and misuse and how to correct that with implementation. So with that, we'll kind of round out the, this um, talk. Um, with a scientific approach to stopping low value hormone therapy. So take us back to where there's potential overuse and um, how we could uh, take a scientific approach to it. So I would argue that stopping inappropriate um, or low value ADT could prevent fractures and heart disease and diabetes and metabolic syndrome. I think it would improve quality of life. We know that uh, there's significant burdens from ADT and it could also improve spending. Um, without potentially compromising survival. But in terms of the field of care delivery and uh, implementation research, we don't really know how best to de-implement practices. How do we stop doing th something that it, there's a precedence for? How do we take that history and context into account uh, when we go to uh, implement guidelines that say, don't stop or stop using this? And so, um, there's a lot uh, to unpack there. And so uh, folks have started to try to do this. And when we think about, you know, what types of practice we might want to de-implement or pull out of practice, there's those things that are contradicted. So things like percutaneous coronary intervention that was later found in some cases to be inferior to medical therapy for cardiac disease, um, things that you want to get out of practice. I would say uh, unproven medical practices like ADT and, and some of its indications. And then there's novel medical practices that get out into the real world prior to rigorous testing. And so keeping a leash, a short leash on those so that if they don't work or they're causing harm, that we could extract them from clinical practice. And so we talked about the history of ADT and we talked about the economic implications. And, and it's important to recognize that some of these things are entrenched in our clinical care delivery, and there may be re resistance to the implementation. So how do we study from that? How do we study that? And how do we um, learn from um, the history and context surrounding a care delivery? And this particular article is around radical mastectomy. And it's fascinating to see how um, radical mastectomy evolved as a breast cancer treatment over the decades. And I would argue ADT is uh, similar. This is a nice article uh, in Implementation Science. It's one of the journals uh, studying this, talking about how hard it can be for a clinician, a provider, to change their clinical practice. They not only have to learn new practices, but unlearn 
old and outmoded knowledge in order to you know keep up with the literature and the guidelines and to deliver the best quality of care. Here's some work we did looking at de-implementation of low-value surgery. What what about surgical care uh, can needs to be considered in order to minimize uh, uh, overuse of surgery in terms of um, the fee-for-service world uh, that we live in. So this was uh, also looking at uh, too much surgery and how to minimize uh, low value approaches. So with that, let's do some research. This is the conceptual model from uh, the grant that um, supported this work. And basically, as you can see in the center here, there's the things that we need to consider when we want to minimize primary ADT use to an appropriate level. We have to think about organizational factors and provider factors and patient factors. We have to think about decision-making and uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, formulary restrictions or uh, prior authorizations. How do we go about de-implementing in a way that is sustainable and effective? And so I like to think of this as the basic science of uh, implementation. So here on the left uh, hand side of the screen, you see the um, antigen receptor pathways, and you see abiraterone and enzalutamide, and how those work to improve prostate cancer um, uh, drug efficacy. And likewise, uh, we could think about the behavior of primary ADT prescribing and providers' capability, motivation, and opportunity to, um, to do that. And so we start to think about uh, the connections uh, between these factors. And so in order to do that, um, we, we started off with uh, 20 provider interviews uh, that are theory-based, and we took those components of that um, uh, model on the right and um, made an interview guide and really asked providers what they thought across the country, um, across VAs across the country, about primary ADT. And so this provider said, we certainly talk about ADT, but we don't usually talk about it in the primary setting. Another provider said, I think it's, I think they feel like they're doing something and they, because they have cancer, they got to do something. This provider said, you know, it's, I mean, I might be a little more prone to do it in that 94 year old because he's not a candidate for anything else. This provider say, said, I think it's perceived as old school. I think that one of the things that we have learned that was done fairly commonly, perhaps in the 80s and 90s for a variety of reasons, and we have since learned that that's not necessary. So taking hours of interview um, and really distilling the, what the providers told us, we found three different approaches to primary ADT prescribing. And so we have folks here on the left-hand side that never prescribe primary ADT or continue it when folks come into their practice already on it. Uh, we have folks that are willing under some circumstances uh, to prescribe a primary ADT. And we have folks that think it's uh, part of routine care and they put it on the table as a primary treatment for localized disease. And those folks, if you look here, tended to realize, rely on experience more than on uh, guidelines. Uh, the folks that uh, were willing under some circumstances stated that they take pre preference into account, they might use it to delay primary treatment or let the patient experience side effects and then counsel them to stop afterward. Then there's the folks who never uh, use primary ADT and really adhere to the guidelines and um, 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 offer definitive treatments or observational approaches. And so when we take all this and we go to the basic science of, of low value ADT and, and the de-implementation, you can see that the, the model down here on the, on, the, on the right hand side of the screen starts to get much more complex. And when we think about here on the left hand side of the screen capabilities about uh, knowledge and interpersonal skills and behavioral regulations, we see that we start to identify some pathways and potential opportunities for strategy development around how do we address low value ADT. This circle in the middle here um, essentially ties together what we're finding from our qualitative uh, work and will help direct our strategies uh, for a randomized trial development. So 
Next steps are to really select and target different strategies because we don't know which ones will work best in clinical practice. Uh, we're going to do a provider survey um, to prioritize some approaches uh, and do discrete choice analysis and really understand the relative importance of the different factors from that buyer model. Uh, I thank you in advance if um, you're asked to um, uh, selected to do the survey. I'd appreciate it. And um, I won't share the details, but it might, it might ask you uh, if we were looking at designing a car, uh, would you want a Subaru or a BMW? Do you want a red or a blue car, automatic versus manual transmission? So we'll use that um, experiment to help uh, guide our next steps and really select competing strategies for our randomized trial, whether it's prior authorization or uh, uh, clinical reminders or patient education or coaching or navigation. And so, in conclusion, I just want to say a few things and um, really to take the opportunity of your urologic training and residency and early career fellowship uh, to create those uh, lasting mentors and relationships. I really appreciate Dr. Brandes and his, and his uh, continued support and, um, and, and just appreciate that it's a time to critically question things like that's just how we always do it. Uh, because uh, it may be that that's the best way, but it may be that um, the world has changed and, and the evidence has changed. And so I think that's really, really important. And you can see it, it's played out in, in my uh, career so far. I hope you've uh, I've been able to relay that uh, chemical castration has a rich and evolving history and an evidence base and, and really non-trivial side effects. So we need to take it seriously and make sure we're using it in an evidence-based uh, manner. And then last, uh, lastly, that implementation science is, is an emerging transdisciplinary field, uh, creating rich uh, research opportunities uh, alongside quality improvement and really seeking to improve uh, the practice of your logic care in the real world. Um, as uh, Dr. Brand has uh, mentioned, uh, we do have uh, a um, Dow Division for Health Services Research in our urology. We have a rich VA. Uh, health Services Research Group in Ann Arbor. We have a uh, funded NIH T32 program in Health Services Implementation Science as well as Basic Translational Science um, in Ann Arbor uh, where you can come and, and spend a, a couple years and get an advanced degree, uh, master's degree at uh, top level uh, school and really get a rich mentorship investment. This work was uh, completed with um, a, a team and 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 long-term mentors and, and collaborators and other consultants and supported um, with uh, a variety of grants. So uh, again, thank you so much. Uh, um, happy Monday morning to you and, and I'm glad to take uh, any questions.